I sometimes tell people who I meet who are discouraged about the magnitude of some of the problems we face in this world today that if they find themselves one morning waking up and they're really discouraged, get in your car and get over to a university campus, hopefully Stanford, but most university campuses would be fine. Find the first graduate student you run across and ask that student what he or she is working on. And you will walk away from that discussion inspired because you will find these are young people who have no concept that, that problems are unsolvable, no concept that they can't fix things. And you'll find them in a, in a mood and in a spirit that will, I think, enable you to walk away from that discussion just inspired. And that's what's great for me about being at a place like Stanford. It's definitely difficult today to find a river that is not impacted in some way by mankind. Um, in my research, I look at contaminants in rivers, um, for example, pharmaceuticals and other compounds you wouldn't necessarily expect to see. Um, but by studying their fate in the environment, we can try to um, engineer systems that will attenuate them more quickly to get rid of them or in some way prevent effects on an ecosystem. Engineers apply science to meet human needs and to tackle global challenges. More than 230 faculty and nearly 4,000 students at the Stanford School of Engineering pursue this goal. To achieve it, we have research priorities in bioengineering, the environment and energy, information technology, and nanotechnology. We are also dedicated to educating the leaders of tomorrow, teaching not only deep engineering expertise, but also teamwork, creativity, and problem solving through multidisciplinary programs such as in design and entrepreneurship education. Having global scale problems in the environment or in human health are tremendous opportunities for our students and our faculty to take basic ideas, engineer things or create things that are going to make a difference and then apply them to some of these global scale problems. And there are many, many examples of this in the School of Engineering today. Heart and cardiovascular diseases kill hundreds of thousands of Americans every year. Developing advanced patient-specific computer models, Stanford engineers can improve our understanding and diagnosis of disease and make surgery more effective. So we've developed tools to reconstruct patients' uh, vascular anatomy from medical imaging data, for instance, from magnetic resonance or computed tomography data, and then simulate that actual person's blood flow um, using uh, these uh, software tools. Math can be a very powerful tool when you're trying to understand certain physical phenomena. Um, and in our area of interest, it can be very helpful to describe the way flow uh, moves within the arteries and we can get a very accurate description of pressure and velocity fields within the arteries. Two applications of this uh, research are actually understanding mechanisms of cardiovascular disease. For example, how people get uh, heart disease or how aneurysms develop and grow and maybe ultimately rupture. Another application is to use patient-specific modeling, blood flow modeling, to predict an outcome for an intervention. So essentially doing a surgery for a patient on a computer before it's ever done in real life. We're collaborating with a number of physicians in the Stanford uh, Medical Center. Uh, for example, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Feinstein in pediatric cardiology has been working very closely uh, with my lab over, the num over a number of years uh, to help us develop new procedures, new surgical procedures for children with congenital heart disease. The value of a tail lab from my perspective is immeasurable simply because uh, as a engineer in my past, my world of research is engineering and I firmly believe that the ability to apply engineering techniques such as those done in the Taylor lab will basically revolutionize the way that we approach congenital heart disease. Pulmonary hypertension is characterized by an elevation of blood pressure in the pulmonary arteries and if left untreated these patients have a mean survival of only three years so it's a pretty serious disease and so by studying the differences in their anatomy and their physiology we're trying to get a better idea for how this disease works how it progresses and then hopefully come up with a better treatment and improve the outcomes of these patients by using computational simulations to guide cell culture experiments we can learn more about the disease on a cellular level and this can hopefully lead to better therapies in the future the energy challenge is clear and daunting. Discover how to generate about 30 trillion watts of power in a way that doesn't put any carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. 
Stanford engineers are working on making solar power a cost-effective approach to this problem. So our goal is really to make solar power uh, truly affordable uh, because in my opinion, solar power is one of the truly renewable sources of energy that we have. We're trying to use recent advances in nanotechnology uh, to find ways to make solar cells with low-cost materials uh, in a way that enables uh, printing in machines similar to those used to print newspapers. So we in Professor McGee's lab make the solar cells out of two semiconducting materials. In order to maximize the amount of current that we can generate from these cells, we need to have the two semiconductors within about 10 nanometers of each other because uh, on, when the light hits the polymer, it creates charges in the polymer and those charges within the polymer can travel no more than about 10 nanometers. The pattern is this honeycomb structure uh, that is effectively is made of these very small holes. Uh, and the purpose is to get another material to fill in these holes so that you form effectively as intimate a contact as possible. After we finish making the cells, we test them with this solar simulator, which uh, has a spectrum similar to that of the sun. And uh, we found so far that the prototypes have an efficiency of about 1%. We're optimistic that we can get 15% efficiency. If uh, we could get 15% uh, efficiency uh, and we could uh, manufacture these cells at about $30 a meter squared, uh, we would uh, be able to make cells for about 50 cents a watt. And uh, this would uh, make solar electricity competitive with other forms of electricity. Well, I mean, solar energy, when you look at what's available to mankind right now, uh, Solar energy is by far the most abundant energy we have, uh, and given the global problems we're having with the environment, uh, as well as uh, energy deficiencies, this seems like a natural path to the future. They can analyze the, situation. the benefits uh, to teaching entrepreneurship stretch from uh, development of skills that are going to help them be more successful no matter what they do, uh, to more immediate benefits when it's been shown that the retention in engineering goes up, as well as even their GPA. Entrepreneurship education in the Stanford Technology Ventures program turns students into leaders by taking them beyond the fundamentals of engineering to recognize opportunities, to think critically, to work in diverse teams, and to understand the business and market context for innovation. At the national level, whether it's the National Science Foundation or the National Academy of Engineering, every time they write a, a, a report, on what they want to see in engineers in the future. They want to see what I would call entrepreneurial skills. These skills are in several categories. Some of them have to do with an entrepreneurial mindset, and that has, uh, that's the way they perceive, say, change, or they uh, have the tools to tell the difference between an, an idea and a true business opportunity. The other kinds of skills are interpersonal skills. And lastly, there's some just basic business skills. We teach entrepreneurship as a philosophy of how to see the world half full uh, and each challenge as an opportunity, rather than um, as simply a way of training people of how to start businesses. Each student has gone off and each team has gone off to find the opportunity that they're excited about and to explore that opportunity. And they explain it to their peers in the context of what we taught them in the class, how to recognize an opportunity from an idea, from a simple idea, by vetting it against the marketplace to determine whether or not it solves a real problem whether or not it creates real value, who it creates real value for, and what are the impediments to basically being able to realize that value in the marketplace. This class is more than just a business class. It's more than just an engineering class. It really teaches you to analyze an idea, analyze what a technology is, and you realize that, yeah, wow, all these technologies are really cool, but not all of them are a great business idea. Teaching entrepreneurship is all about teaching leadership. It's going to take a lot of leadership in this century to deal with the issues related to human health, to the environment and energy. I think we all could agree that entrepreneurial thinking, innovative thinking, is going to be absolutely necessary to you know, find some of those solutions.